Over 4,000 years ago, God appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia and said to him, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. Abraham obeyed the Lord and came into the promised land of Canaan, where he lived along with his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob, who was later renamed Israel. Israel and his twelve sons went down into Egypt because of a famine in the land of Canaan. And there they multiplied into a mighty nation. The Egyptians felt threatened by the powerful nation of Israel living among them. So they enslaved them and made their lives bitter with hard bondage. After 430 years in Egypt, they were led out of bondage by Moses, then crossed the Red Sea and went into Arabia where they received the law of God at Mount Sinai. The generation of Israelites that left Egypt with Moses were not allowed to enter the promised land because of their lack of faith in the Lord. They were forced to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until a new generation rose up that trusted the Lord and entered the promised land with Joshua. For about 400 years, the 12 tribes of Israel were ruled by the judges according to the law of Moses. When they desired to have a king like all the other nations, God appointed Saul to be their king, who reigned over them for 40 years, followed by King David, who reigned 40 years, and David's son Solomon, who reigned 40 years. During the reign of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was at its most glorious, and the first temple was built. But because Solomon's heart turned away from the Lord in his old age, God told him that 10 of the tribes would not be ruled by his son. After the death of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was divided and the northern 10 tribes were ruled over by a series of wicked kings who were not descended from David and Solomon. The northern kingdom retained the name of Israel and eventually had Samaria as its capital city. The smaller southern kingdom became known as Judah, had Jerusalem as its capital, and was reigned over by the descendants of David. Starting in 2 Kings 16, the people of the southern kingdom became known as Jews after the name of the kingdom of Judah. Because of the wickedness of the northern kingdom of Israel, they were overthrown and taken captive by the Assyrians. The Israelites who remained became intermingled with the heathen nations who came in and occupied the land. These people would become known as the Samaritans, and the ten tribes of northern Israel would never be a nation again. The southern kingdom of Judah would eventually be taken captive into Babylon as a punishment for serving other gods, and the temple would be destroyed. But. After 70 years, the Jews returned to Judah, rebuilt the temple at Jerusalem, and continued to be ruled by kings descended from David. At the time of Christ, the nation of Judah had become known as Judea and was under Roman rule. Jesus Christ and his disciples preached the gospel throughout Judea, seeking after the lost sheep of the house of Israel. After three and a half years of ministry, the Jews rejected Jesus as their Messiah and convinced the Roman governor to crucify him. Three days later, he rose again from the dead and showed himself alive to his disciples before ascending up to the right hand of the Father in heaven. Shortly before Jesus was crucified, he prophesied that as a punishment for rejecting him, Jerusalem would be burned, the temple would be destroyed, and the Jews would be led away captive into all nations. This prophecy was fulfilled in A.D. 70 when future Roman Emperor Titus conquered Jerusalem. For over 1,800 years, the Jews remained scattered throughout all nations. Then, in 1948, the impossible happened. The state of Israel was founded and the Jews once again possessed the promised land. Many Christians have proclaimed this to be a miracle and a blessing from God. 
But was this really the blessing of the Lord? Or were darker forces at work? This film has the answer. So in order to understand the founding of the modern state of Israel, you have to understand the history of the Jews from AD 70 until that time. And you have to understand that their religion is no longer based on the Bible whatsoever. For example, ever since the temple was destroyed, they don't do any animal sacrifices. As far as the animal sacrifices are concerned, that's been discontinued. Finished. What developed in Judaism was the system of prayers. It sort of became a substitute. Well, I think that was the beginning of modernization. I really believe that. Once that temple was destroyed, Jews did not have a central location. They were dispersed. They literally changed the nature of Judaism. And that portable form of Judaism led a transformation from priestly Judaism to rabbinic Judaism. Judaism stopped being the religion of the Old Testament and began to be the religion of the rabbis and their traditions, or what they call the oral Torah. The Talmud is the holy book of the Jews. It was the oral sayings of the rabbis. Mm. It's known as the wisdom of the rabbis. The Talmud is a compilation of all the great discussions that took place from the second century BC mm -hmm. until the fifth century CE. It's a kind of encyclopedia right. of Jewish knowledge. The best way of calling it would be the Jewish Wikipedia of the ages. <laughs> yes, because many people participated in it. Right. It's not written by one person. Several hundred hundreds. scholars. Okay. Hundreds of scholars. Hundreds of authors. According to Judaism, the oral law, or what would later be known as the Talmud, was given to the 70 elders that came to the base of Mount Sinai but were not allowed to proceed any further. The Pharisees believed that these 70 elders received a much more extensive and profound revelation than Moses, which was not to be written down. It was only to be passed down orally. And these oral traditions took precedence over the written Torah, or what we know as Genesis through Deuteronomy. Evidence of this is found in the Talmud itself. Ereben 21b, my son, be more careful in the observance of the words of the scribes than in the words of the Torah. That's what differentiates the Orthodox from the non-Orthodox. The non-Orthodox sees the Talmud as more man-made. More man-made and developing and so on and so forth. Whereas you believe the Talmud is inspired by God. Is inspired by God, yeah. Everything that has anything to do with scripture is considered the word of God by a large segment of the... Including the Talmud. Yes. He said you don't believe in the religion of Moses. You have for your religion, he told the Jews, you have for your religion the traditions of the elders. In Mark 7, 7, Jesus said of the Pharisees, How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men? And the Talmud is the doctrines of men. It's, it's not possible for an ordinary person that's not trained to, to just read the Talmud and understand the oral law. Right. It's very complex. You need a teacher. Has a typical rabbi read it cover to cover? I don't know. It depends what they studied. Have you read it cover to cover? I, I wouldn't say I read all 36 volumes, oh, but okay. I've read several. Right. You've read a lot of it, obviously. Yes. Sure. But um, I'm sure people that devote their energies to just study mm -hmm. have done that. Sure. The Jews have always known throughout history that if Christians knew what was in the Talmud, it would make Christians very angry. 
And so the Jews were able to conceal a lot of their most blasphemous statements about the Lord Jesus Christ because people didn't speak Hebrew. Here's what they say about Jesus in the Talmud. There's sections in there about Jesus. In fact, there's an entire book that's been written by the director of Judaic studies in Princeton University, Dr. Schaefer, a Jew. He's written a book, Jesus and the Talmud. So if you want to know what Jesus has to do with the Talmud, get his book, Jesus in the Talmud by Dr. Schaefer. Peter Schaefer is head of the Judaic studies at Princeton University. In his book, Jesus and the Talmud, he documents and analyzes every time Jesus is mentioned in the pages of the Talmud. Keep in mind that the Talmud was written hundreds of years after Christ lived. And so it has references about Jesus in it, and they are hateful, blasphemous references. According to the Talmud, Jesus was the product of adultery, the bastard son of Mary and a Roman soldier named Pantera. He spent his early life in Egypt, where he learned black magic, idolatry, and sorcery. Jesus was born to a whore. Mary was a whore. She had sexual relations with many men. The father was a Roman centurion. The Talmud further blasphemes the Lord Jesus by calling him a fool and comparing him with Old Testament villains such as Balaam, Ahithophel, Doeg, and Gehazi. Does the Talmud talk about the Jews killing Jesus? Or Vaguely, they... but Maimonides believes that the, the Jews killed him, that the Jews executed him because of certain of his doctrines and, and, and so forth. Do you believe that the Jews killed Jesus? Um, it's possible the Jews did kill Jesus. Right. So okay. if, let's say they did. All right? we, maybe he deserved to die. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was a troublemaker. Let's assume we did. Mm -hmm. So we killed somebody. The Talmud actually gloats about Jesus dying young. The passage reads, Hast thou heard how old Balaam was? He replied, Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days. It follows that he was 33 or 34 years old. And you say, wait, that passage says Balaam, not Jesus. But look at the footnote at the bottom of the page. Balaam is frequently used in the Talmud as a type of Jesus. Not only that, but in the Jewish Encyclopedia, volume two, page 469, under Balaam it says, Balaam given to Jesus in Sanhedrin 106b and Gittin 57a. Peter Schaefer states in his book, Jesus in the Talmud, that there can be no doubt that the narrative of the execution in the Talmud refers to Jesus. In fact, the book states, there is no reason to feel ashamed because we rightfully executed a blasphemer and idolater. Jesus deserved death, and he got what he deserved. Elsewhere, the book states, he was a blasphemer and idolater, and although the Romans probably could not care less, we insisted that he get what he deserved. We even convinced the Roman governor, or more precisely, forced him to accept that this heretic and imposter needed to be executed, and we are proud of it. Schaefer said in an article that appeared in Publishers Weekly concerning his new book, I certainly don't want to harm Jewish Christian dialogue, but dialogue requires honesty, and I'm trying to be honest. There are Masonic Jews today who want to take the Talmud and make it Christian. How can you take a, a damnable book and make it Christian? All of these lies about Jesus are right there. The church fathers blamed the Jews for the death of Jesus, and that is Paul's doing. It was Paul's doing in the epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, mm -hmm. verse 14 and 15. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus. Now, what does that say? This has poisoned the mind of generations of Christians, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? So 1 Thessalonians this is 2, Paul. okay. To this day, 26% of all Americans believe that Jews were responsible in the death of Jesus. When Mel Gibson came out with his The Temptation of Christ, yeah. oh, he's an anti-Semite, what a horrible person. He says the Jews, you know, killed Jesus. 
Well, that's what the Bible says. The film, uh, the, the, the Passion of the Christ, when it was shown, it went from 26% to 36% because people are so gullible. It portrays the Jews as evil people. Oh, okay. Which is nonsense. The Jews call this the myth that the Jews killed Jesus. Let me explain something to you. The fact that the Jews killed Jesus is not a myth. It's Bible. Christians believed it, and they still do today. They still do today. It was ingrained in their mind. They blamed all the Jews, even though most of the Jews were not there. Look at Acts chapter 3, verse 13. It says, The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. So here he's preaching to thousands of Jews. And he says, And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. Wait a minute, I thought it was just the rulers. No, he said, you did it, as also did your rulers. That means it wasn't just the rulers, it was the people also. Because if we read the scriptural account, the people are crying out, a mass throng of thousands and thousands of the Jews are crying out, crucify him. And he says, shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. I am free from the blood of this just person, said the Roman Pilate. His blood be on us and on our children. That's what they said. It states in there that Jesus corrupted Judaism. And as punishment for his crimes, he is now in hell, burning in fiery excrement. And he shall so be forever and ever. They hate Jesus Christ. They hate the name. So I think it's because they are children of the devil, not children of God, and therefore the devil, look at the hatred he has for Christ. So what do you think his children are going to have? The average Jew believes that the Old Testament is a wonderful book of myths mm -hmm. and stories that have good meaning. Yeah. But you can understand the Old Testament only by studying the Talmud and the Kabbalah. The Jews stopped believing in the Torah starting in Genesis chapter 1. I believe creation was a design that's unending. Mm -hmm. uh, evolution is part of the process. And the beginning to me, you know, there are people who talk about the Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. I have no quarrel with them. So you don't take the beginning of Genesis with the Garden of Eden and the serpent, you don't take that literally then? No, I, I, to me, those are parables. So when you look at the key teachings of the books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy, the Jews don't really believe any of these. Circumcision, I know, is a big part Ouch. of. <laughs> it's it's a big part of, of Judaism. I I think. Am I right? It is. If a, an adult comes to me for a conversion and is not circumcised, then it's a very simple matter. There's, you take the uh, pin and just prick the, um, so that a drop of blood comes out, mm. and that's enough. That's so it's the, more symbolic. Right. Just to represent the willingness to be able to be part of that covenant. So they don't remove the full foreskin? No. Okay, they just do just a more of a symbolic? Exactly. Well, in the Torah, you know, Abraham was 99 when he was circumcised, <laughs> and his son Ishmael was 13, right? But nowadays, they don't. They don't. Now, we as New Testament Christians don't practice circumcision. But the Jews, remember, are saying that they still follow that old Mosaic law. So if they were actually following it, they would have to actually remove the foreskin and circumcise that adult convert. That's what the Torah teaches. I've heard it said so many times that, oh, the Jews, they just believe the Old Testament. They, they, they believe everything we do just without Jesus. And that is a lie. They don't believe God. They don't believe Jesus Christ. They don't believe the Old Testament. They don't believe the New Testament. They don't believe any of it. And how is it determined which is good and which is bad? And that's called civilization. People get together and determine you shouldn't steal. So civilization says that's bad. Okay, that's how you measure good. If you come from a society where stealing is good, that's how that civilization determines good from bad. If you don't steal, you're bad. If you do steal, you're part of us. Is there an absolute right and wrong where just stealing is always wrong because God said so? 
There's no absolute in my opinion. It says in John 5, 46 and 47, for if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Jesus Christ is telling the Jews of his day that they did not believe Moses. Their whole claim was that they believe Moses and they don't believe him. But he explains here that if you don't believe in him, then you don't believe in Moses. We practice differently, we believe differently, and maybe our approach is different, but the destination is the same. We're trying to reach God. I mean, that's the whole objective. So you believe that all religions are going to the same destination, just taking different routes to get exactly, there? and different ways to get there, and different understandings of how they get there. That that doesn't make one better than the other. There is no one path to God. There is no one understanding of God. To understand God, we have to understand each other. We have to understand ourselves. There is no such thing as a salvation um, that transforms it. You do what is right, and you save yourself at every moment. God is not in heaven. If when someone starts telling me that his soul is in heaven, what do they know about the soul, the spiritual souls of people in heaven? This is for children. You have to tell them this way. How come grandfather didn't come home today? Oh, he's in heaven. What about hell? Is, is hell something that, that is part of Judaism or no? It being like a place of fiery punishment. For example. I have been in hell. Mm. What we call hell is the Valley of Hinnom. Tophet also, right? There is a place right outside of Jerusalem that is called the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom. Mm -hmm. It was a place where pagans used to offer human sacrifices. And by extrapolation somehow, they imagined that there was a place like that in the universe mm -hmm. somewhere where wicked people would be going. So you, you don't believe that the Old Testament teaches any kind of a, a literal hell? No. Okay, all right. A lot of people will tell you the Bible says, if you don't do something, you'll have a bad life or you'll go to the netherworld. Hell. Yeah, right, right. well, we don't subscribe to hell <laughs> anyway, but you know, that kind of, uh, my feeling is different if the Jews don't believe in the creation story of Genesis 1, they don't believe the story of Adam and Eve literally, they don't believe in Noah, they don't believe in the Tower of Babel, they scoff at these stories, they don't believe in circumcising adults, they don't believe in the animal sacrifice, what part of the Torah do they believe in? This is supposedly their most exalted book, yet when you look at all the particulars of what the Torah teaches, they don't believe any of it. Today you have a lot of evangelical Christians in America that are very pro-Israel. Very. Christians are just really zealous in their uh, support of, of Israel. Now, has it always been that way throughout history? Oh, Is that God, a newer no. phenomenon? No, um, no it, it hasn't been that way through history. Traditionally, uh, Christianity was essentially anti-Semitic. The phenomenon of the Christian Zionists is relatively recent. They maintain that the Jews are God's chosen people and will always be God's chosen people. They use the term the apple of God's eye. And, and that's a more recent phenomenon? Yeah, I'd say a few hundred years, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. That does not go all the way back. Right. Replacement theology mm -hmm. has played a very important role in Christianity. But what is replacement theology? Replacement theology is the root and branch of Christian anti-Semitism. It's like a virus in the church basically is saying that the church now has superseded Israel and this theology that discards the place of the Jewish people and replaces it with the church, the new and true spiritual Israel, is very dangerous because I believe it's the primary root of anti-Semitism. Many theologians all through the centuries have preached replacement theology. Can you name some that, that have preached that? I have here everything about uh, John Chrysostom, and uh, the, 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 he is the chief anti-Semite of the church. The synagogue is worse than a whorehouse. It is the den of scoundrels, 
and the repair of wild beasts. The Temple of Demons, devoted to idolatrous cults. The Refuge of Debauchees and the Cavern of Devils. It is a criminal assembly of Jews. A place of meeting for the assassins of Christ. A den of thieves. A dwelling of iniquity. The refuge of devils. A gulf and an abyss of perdition. I would say the same things about their souls. They have demonized the Jews. This is still present in the mind of many. Throughout history, Christians have not looked at the Jews as God's chosen people. They looked at them as a people that rejected Christ and were therefore rejected by God. For example, the last book written by Martin Luther before he died was called The Jews and Their Lies. And in this book, he gives all kinds of scriptural arguments for why the Jews are not God's chosen people. And he also exposes a lot of the blasphemous teachings of the Talmud. His very last sermon, he preached about the Jews. And he said, the Jews hate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And through their perfidious behavior, and he says that they, they create all kinds of stratagems and ruses to deceive us. And he got so angry at them, he actually said, we should go and burn all the copies of their Talmud. But he was inf infuriated about the Talmud. Of course, today, the Jews consider him a great anti-Semite. St. Augustine was no better. He was also anti-Semitic? That's right. Okay. He was very demeaning. All this mm. is pure hatred. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether you're listening to John Chrysostom, St. Augustine, Peter the Venerable, Martin Luther, John Calvin. You name the church father. You name the Protestant leader throughout history. They're all saying the same thing about the Jews, that they're the synagogue of Satan, that it's a false religion. This doctrine that the Jews are still God's chosen people is a new doctrine. You know, back before the late 1800s, everybody recognized what we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. But something began to change. First with Dr. Uh, you know, Cyrus Schofield. C.I. Schofield was a divorced man. He had trouble with alcohol. He was a lawyer turned preacher. He left his first wife, Leontine Sierre, in 1883. That's the year after he wrote his first book, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. So in 1882, he writes his first book, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. 1883, he leaves his first wife, marries another lady, and then becomes a pastor in Texas. Very famous, very popular. Schofield's dispensational premillennial Bible was edited with financial assistance from prominent businessmen, some of which had questionable religious ties. And he had Jewish retainers who made him a member of a club called the Lotus Club, mm -hmm. a, a sort of a secret society. And suddenly he had plenty of money. This corrupt lawyer who had abandoned his wife and was found guilty of numerous offenses as, as a corrupt attorney. But Schofield was given money and the Oxford group out of England published his Bible. Why would they take a crooked lawyer and make him the editor of a Bible? And then suddenly they had millions of dollars to promote it. With that amount of money, then the Bible took off. And it, it basically sealed the deal for the Jews. The Schofield Reference Bible is very pro-Israel, very Zionist. And this book, more than any other book, changed the thinking of an entire generation of young preacher boys. Another belief that Christians have today that is an incorrect belief that is not founded in scripture is the belief that we should bless Israel. You know, they, they go back to the, what they refer to as the Abrahamic covenant. They go back to Genesis chapter 12 and they say, oh, we got to bless Israel. If we want God's blessing, we have to bless them. Genesis 12 verses one through three is the key scripture where God calls and blesses Abraham. It reads, now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. 
and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, according to this scripture, God is making a covenant with Abraham, and he tells Abraham, I will bless thee. The word thee is singular. He's speaking to Abraham. Well, in Schofield's notes on Genesis 12, he applies this blessing unto the future nation of Israel. That is not what the scripture teaches. And many evangelical Christians today do not get their doctrine on Israel from anything that's written in the New Testament. They're getting it from the notes of the Schofield Reference Bible. When you're reading these promises made to Abraham in the Old Testament, you have to realize what the Bible teaches in Galatians 3.16 when it says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Now, if we stopped right there, you know, all the Christians of today or Zionists or whoever, they could say, see, it was to Abraham and his seed. But the verse goes on, it says, he saith not and to seeds, with an S at the end, making it plural. He says, he saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. So according to the Bible, the promises made to Abraham were made unto Abraham and unto Christ. And the Bible says in verse 29, And if ye be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. According to the Bible, we as Christians, whether we be Jew or Gentile, are the heirs of the promises made to Abraham. Those today who are in the Middle East and the nation of Israel, they're not in Christ. 99% of them do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, they are not the seed of Abraham. Therefore, Genesis 12, 1 through 3 does not apply unto them. You know, people will say, well, we've got to support Israel if we want God's blessing on ourselves. If we want God's blessing on our church, if we want God's blessing on our nation, we must support a physical Israel. Well, if you just count back the last 66, 67 years of American history, do you find the blessing of God on our country? Did we have legalized abortion back in the 1940s? No, it's come since then. What was our debt in the 1940s versus today? What were we like then compared to what we are now? You can't convince me that the blessings of God have fallen on this country because of a quote unquote promise to support a physical group of people somehow correlates to blessings from God. Not only that, but if you look at the history of the Jews over the last 2,000 years, have they been blessed by God? No, they've been persecuted and hated in every country that they've ever been in. This book right here has a list of all of the countries that the Jews have been thrown out of over the last 1,000 years. And when you look at this huge list, you have to ask yourself, why have they been so hated and persecuted everywhere that they've lived? And the answer is because of their blasphemy toward Christianity, and because of their predatory lending practices. In the late 1800s, persecution of the Jews in Russia and elsewhere intensified, and many Jews began to believe that their only hope for a prosperous future would be to possess a state of their own. This belief became known as Zionism. The Jewish state was the uh, realization of the great project of Theodor Herzl. Theodor Herzl. He was the founder of Zionism. But he came to the idea that the cause of anti-Semitism is because the Jews do not have a state of their own. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a little booklet, The State of the Jews. He said there is only one way of protecting the Jewish people in the future, for the Jews to leave Europe mm -hmm. and to settle in their homeland, the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. And that book became like the Bible of Zionism. Zionism was the formation of the hope for the rebirth. It started with World War I, mm -hmm. the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration was significant. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a letter to a friend. I mean, it had, right, no, I understand it, it was a major document. In terms of expressing yeah. British policy. Mm -hmm. So the Balfour Declaration was a letter from Lord Balfour to, to Lord, Lord Rothschild. Rothschild. In World War I, Turkey was an ally of Germany, who was the losing side. So the Turkish Ottoman Empire was dismantled. And so because the Turkish Empire was dismantled after World dismantled. War I, the British Lord Balfour wrote a declaration yes. saying that it should be a homeland for the Jews. Yes, that was the beginning of the uh, larger immigration. Tens of thousands of Jews from Eastern Europe mainly mm -hmm. went to uh, settle in Israel. 
The Balfour Declaration was a letter written to Lord Rothschild. So in order to understand the Balfour Declaration, we have to know who Rothschild was. Money is power. Money is the only weapon that the Jew has to defend himself with. Oh. Meyer Amschel Bauer, born in Frankfurt, Germany in 1744, was a moneylender and a goldsmith on Jew Street, whose shop had a sign out front with a red hexagram on it. Eventually, he would change his name to Rothschild, which is German for red sign. Rothschild soon learned that loaning money to governments and kings was more profitable than loaning money to private individuals. Not only were the loans bigger, but they were secured by the nation's taxes. Meyer Rothschild had five sons whom he trained in the skills of money creation and sent out to the major capitals of Europe to open branches of the family banking business. You are five brothers. I want you each to start a banking business in a different country. One to go and open a house in Paris, one in Vienna, one in London. Choose the most important centers so that when money is to be sent from here to London, let us say, you won't have to risk life and gold. And here, here in Frankfurt, we'll just send a letter to Nathan in London saying, pay so-and-so, and that will be offset by loans from London to Frankfurt. Understand? Yes. In your day, there will be many wars in Europe. A nation that have money to transport will come to the Rothschilds because it will be safe. Your five banking houses may cover Europe but you will be one firm, one family, the Rothschilds, who work always together. That will be your power. When Meyer Amschel Rothschild died in 1812, he left a will instructing his sons in how the House of Rothschild would be operated. All key positions in the House of Rothschild were to be held by members of the family, the family was to intermarry with their own first and second cousins, thus preserving the vast fortune. Rothschild's heirs were strictly forbidden to ever disclose the amount of their wealth. The whole family was driven by an insatiable lust for the accumulation of wealth and power. They secretly financed both sides in various European wars, dominated European banking, and by the mid-1800s, had become the richest family in the world. Rothschild helped found uh, Israel, and Rothschild has always been the backer of Israel. Whatever Rothschild wants, he gets. It, it is believed that he is the richest man in the world, and I, I have little doubt of that. Although the Balfour Declaration was given to Lord Rothschild in 1917, it would not be until 1947 that the plan for a Jewish state would be implemented. It would take the horrors of World War II to get public opinion behind creating a Jewish state in the land of Palestine. In 1947, the United Nations declared that there would be two states in Palestine. There would be a Jewish state and a Palestinian state. The United States delegation supports the basic principles of the unanimous recommendations by the United Nations which provides for partition and immigration. Later, Russia supported the United States on the partition recommendation, while Arab states threatened reprisals, as the Holy Land's future hangs in the balance. But Israel became the first state, and they've never allowed Palestine to become a state. So they've made sure that the, the United Nations provision has never been put into effect. On May 14th, 1948, David Ben-Gurion, the executive head of the Zionist organization, declared the establishment of the Jewish state in the land of Israel. In May of 1948, a new Jewish state, Israel, was born in a bath of blood. Jewish troops routed Arab forces from the city of Haifa in the first of a series of battles that were to reverberate through the years. The new government, headed by David Ben-Gurion, is installed in Tel Aviv. Thus, for the first time since the Roman legion destroyed Jerusalem in the year 70 A.D., the Jewish people have a nation of their own. 
today a lot of Christians think that like God brought the nation of Israel back, you know, and, and God did this wonderful work. But really, was it really the will of God to bring these people back into Israel or was it the will of the United Nations? The Bible tells us very clearly in Hebrews chapter 4 that when they first came to the promised land with Moses, they could not enter in because of unbelief. Then 40 years later, their children who believed the Lord were allowed to enter the promised land. Then later, they worshiped other gods, and what did God do? He removed them from the promised land. They went to Babylon for 70 years. Then after they repented and turned away from their false gods, they were brought back to the promised land. Then when they rejected Jesus Christ, they were removed from the promised land again. And then in 1947, they all believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and God brought them back to the promised land. Is that what happened? No. Did they believe in Christ? I mean, look, uh, Christian out there, ask yourself that question. Was there a revival going on in Israel? Were people accepting Jesus as their Messiah? The answer is no. So therefore, that was not God bringing back Israel because they believed in Him. He said He would scatter them if they didn't keep His word, and He did. He said He'd bring them back when they turned unto Him. They have not turned unto Him. And so if it's not the Lord who brought them back, then who did bring them back? It was the spirit of Antichrist that brought them back to the Promised Land. It was the United Nations who brought them back to the Promised Land. Thus history was made as the Jewish state of Israel was born. Conceived in strife and weaned on violence, Israel has flourished to become a constructive voice in world affairs. Her flag became a symbol of hope in a troubled world. The Star of David, where does that symbol come from? It's never written explicitly in the Bible itself. Is it in the Talmud? Perhaps. Is there a passage in the Bible about that or no? No. Okay. So you're not really sure exactly where that comes from? No. You got me. Is it nobody knows, <laughs> yeah, huh? I, know. I don't know. I'm not, yeah. Because I know it's called the Star of David. Yeah. Does that have anything to do with David? No, I don't think so. There must be somewhere, I'm, uh, I uh, do not remember exactly what the association was. Okay. I believe that what they call the Star of David is actually the Star of Remphan. Because when you study the Bible, you'll see that when they worshiped other gods, the Bible talks about them carrying the banner of the star of their god, Remphan. You rejected the God of the Bible. You took up for yourself the star, that's the six-pointed star, of your god called Remphan or Kiun. All these were names for Moloch, the great Baal, the great fire god, who was the devil. Beelzebub. That's right, Beelzebub. And they were shocked about this. Now, who is this star god? If they only read their old, the Old Testament, they would know this. In Amos, God says, you have taken up the star, and you've made me furious by doing that. And you have actually sacrificed your own children to the star God through the fires. They sacrificed their own children, the Jews did, to the star God. When they worshiped a false god, they had the star of Remphan as an icon and as a symbol. We never see a star of David in scripture, but the star of the false god Remphan. And so we know today that they are not worshiping the true God because the Bible says, he that denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. If the Jews do not believe on the Son, the Bible says they don't have the Father. So who do they have? Somebody else, a false God. Therefore, they're not worshiping the same God that we worship. Some people will say, oh, they worship God the Father, they just don't acknowledge Jesus. But the Bible teaches that it's impossible to worship the Father if you don't acknowledge the Son. Wow. You get back to the Masonic fraternity of Freemasonry. Yeah. Their great symbol is G. You, you'll look at the, the star on the compass, which is a stylized Star of David. In fact, they have the entire Star of David in many Masonic temples. Why is that? Masonry is a study of Judaism and of the Kabbalah. The Jewish Tribune newspaper on October 28, 1927, stated, Freemasonry is based on Judaism. Eliminate the teachings of Judaism from the Masonic ritual and what is left. Albert Pike said in his book, Morals and Dogma, that the, the Kabbalah is the very basis. Without the Kabbalah, we would not have the 33 rituals of the Masonic Lodge. But the God they worship, the great architect, 
is Moloch, the star god. If anyone tells me that the Jews were not placed under a great curse by Jesus himself, it's there. In John 8, 37, it's interesting because Jesus said this. He said, I know that ye are Abraham's seed. So he's acknowledging the fact that they are physical descendants of Abraham. He said, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word have no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. So it's interesting because in verse 37, he acknowledged that they're Abraham's seed. He acknowledged that they're physical descendants of Abraham. But then in verse 39, he's questioning, he's saying, you know, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. And he's basically saying, you're not the children of Abraham, because like we already talked about later in the passage, he says, you're of your father, the devil. So it's interesting that Jesus himself said that you can be a physical descendant of Abraham and be of the seed of Abraham, and he doesn't consider you a child of Abraham. There is another passage. It's in the Gospel of John. Okay. John chapter 8, verse 44, mm. where he says that the Jews are the sons of the devil. Mm. Wow. That's what he was preaching. Wow. Jesus himself taught, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So according to the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, ye are of your father, the devil. So Jesus believed that they weren't following Abraham, they weren't following Moses, they weren't following the prophets, they weren't following God. He says they're following their father, the devil. You know, in Revelation 2 and 3, there's interesting verses, which talk about them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. It's not hard to figure out who the synagogue of Satan is when you realize that there's only one religion in this world that uses synagogues, Judaism. It's not hard to figure out who they are when the Bible tells us that they say they're Jews and they're not. Not everyone in this world goes around saying, I'm a Jew. People who practice Judaism say that they're Jews. You say, well, Pastor Anderson, they say they are Jews, but they really are. No, because Romans 2.28 says, for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. The Bible says we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So in God's eyes, they're not Jews, they're the synagogue of Satan. The Bible says in Revelation 3, 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Now, why would God have to make the synagogue of Satan to know that God loved the church at Philadelphia? Because the Jews think that God loves only them. They don't think that God loves the Gentiles in Philadelphia. And that's why God said, I'm going to make the synagogue of Satan to know that I've loved you. God loves the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They're precious in his sight. In 1 John 2.22, the Bible gives a definition of what an antichrist is. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Now, in order to believe that Jesus is not the Christ, you have to believe that there is a Christ and that it's not Jesus. John 4 tells us that the word Messiah means Christ. The woman at the well, she said, I know that Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. So we know that the definition of the word Christ is Messiah. So in 1 John 2.22, when it says, who is a liar, but he that denied that Jesus is the Christ, what it's saying is, who is a liar, but he that denied that Jesus is the Messiah. So, you know, what group of people believes that there is a Messiah, but does not believe that Jesus was that Messiah? Again, those are the Jews. Let me just see if I can characterize this right then. Basically, the, the, the Jewish belief on Jesus is, I mean, you obviously doesn't, don't believe he was the Messiah, but you just kind of think he was just kind of just another in a long stream of false messiahs. If, if 
Yes. If he even claimed to be if that, he claimed, you're, you're or not he was, sure that he if the claim was that. made, if, if the claim was made that he's the Messiah, he's mm -hmm. a false Messiah. Jesus never said, "I am the Messiah." The Jewish people would be, would have been interested in the Messiah. Right. They're waiting for Messiah. They want Messiah. Yeah. So if he had any of the real characteristics of a Messiah, they would have been interested in him. Mm -hmm. They would have checked and so on and so forth. But it, he had twelve disciples. That's not a lot. I mean, you know, you're talking about the nation of the Jews with all the scholars. Right. They weren't one over ten. They didn't believe in him. Not at all. The Christians invented the idea of a failed Messiah. Even though he failed, he's still the Messiah. We reject that. If, if you fail, then you're not the Messiah. They're still looking for another Messiah to come. And we know that that other Messiah that's coming is the Antichrist. What does a Jewish Messiah look like? A very powerful king mm -hmm. that will establish peace and goodwill on earth. You have to be able to establish peace. World peace. World peace. Mm -hmm. He says when the real Messiah makes his appearance in such a dramatic fashion that it can't be denied, then everybody will acknowledge that he's the real Messiah. And that worldwide. Worldwide. Even the non Jews, because of because they're all looking forward to the Messiah. So when the Messiah comes, you're saying the whole world's gonna believe on him. Yeah. The entire everybody. world, because his purpose will be to bring the entire world to the proper observance. All the nations will stream towards Jerusalem to learn from him. Okay. It will initiate a period of world peace. Mm -hmm. The Messiah will be a tremendous charismatic figure with great, great knowledge and communication skills. He'll also be a great warrior. He will be the defender of the Jews and he will defeat all their enemies in a permanent kind of a way. If you listen to how the Jews describe their Messiah, they paint a perfect picture of what the Bible describes as the Antichrist. He's gonna conquer the entire world. He's gonna bring peace through war. He's going to be believed on by all religions of the world. He's going to bring world peace. He's going to unite us all. So many Christians are precious, and they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. You know, I, I, I was at a prophecy conference in Florida, and a lady came up to me, and she was wearing the, the Star of David. Wow. And I asked her why she was wearing that. She says, oh, well, this is so important that we show our support for Israel. I said, how do you show your support for Israel? Well, she says, I give money every month to the Temple Mount Foundation. Well, that's this, this Jewish group. And I said, don't you know that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says the Antichrist will go into that temple and declare himself God and above every other God? She says, well, I just think I'm helping to fulfill Bible prophecy. I said, you are. You're helping the Antichrist to come. I mean, who would want to do that? When a man comes and he fights the wars of Israel, defeats the enemies, builds a temple, peace on earth, the leader that did that, we will all kneel before the king. Do you know what I mean? Whoever that is. So your vision of that, you say it's a second coming. Okay. We say it's a first coming. Look, the Jews are ready to accept the Antichrist as their Messiah. And yet Christians are being taught that in the end times, all of the Jews are going to believe on Jesus Christ. Well, it doesn't take a genius to figure out what the devil's doing here. When the Jews accept the Antichrist as their Messiah, then all of the apostate Christians are going to point to that and say, look, this is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Look, all the Jews believe on him. What is the devil's goal with the Antichrist? To get people to believe that he is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And like all other false doctrine, it's based on taking one scripture completely out of context. They'll take the end of Romans 11, completely ignore the beginning of Romans 11, and they'll just go straight to the end. They'll go to verse 26, and so all Israel shall be saved. And say, see right there, in the end times, everybody in Israel is going to get saved. They're going to believe in Jesus. But they're forgetting that the Bible just finished telling us in Romans 9 that they're not all Israel, which are of Israel. The physical descendants are not the true Israel. He said he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. He's a Jew, which is one inwardly. It's those of us that believe in Jesus Christ that are Israel. So how could you look at an unsaved person and say that they are Israel when the Bible says all Israel shall be saved? That tells me that anybody who's not saved is not Israel. And it's the Antichrist, not Jesus Christ, it's the Antichrist who is going to unite Jews with false Christians with every other religion of the world. In order for the Jewish Antichrist to unite all religions of the world, 
The devil must convince mainstream Christianity to see the Jews as fellow believers, in spite of their rejection and blasphemy of Jesus Christ. Tele-evangelists such as John Hagee ignore the clear teachings of the New Testament and apply the promises made to Abraham in Genesis 12 verses 1 through 3 to modern-day Christ-rejecting Israel. Anyone who holds a biblical view that the Jews are no longer God's chosen people is labeled by the media as an anti-Semite. Israel's fight is our fight. We are one. We are united. We will not be discouraged. We will not be defeated. We will not be intimidated. We will not sit down. We will not be silent. We are the worst nightmare of the anti-Semites of the world. The victory is going to be ours. If you will not stand with Israel and the Jews, then I will not stand with you. Thank you, and God bless you. you no, know, we stand with the people of Israel. I am asking you to join with me and every Christian and every Jew and every freedom-loving American to demand that this president and Congress do whatever is necessary to eradicate the evil of ISIS and radical Islam from the face of the earth. It is time to act now. And I will bless them that bless you and curse him that curses you. Ah, uh, you don't want to be an enemy and of Israel. And in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. Yes, amen. You're either for or against her. You're one of the two. The man, the church, the nation that blesses the state of Israel, the Jewish people, will be blessed beyond measure. Blessing Israel doesn't just mean, so, well, I bless you. Yeah. You have to stand with them in their hour of need. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Bible says in 2 John 9 through 11, that whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. And what are you doing when you bid someone Godspeed? You're blessing them. So today's evangelical Christianity is saying that we must bless Israel if we want God to bless us. Yet 2 John teaches that if we bless those who deny the Son of God, we are a partaker of their evil deeds. Evangelicals, of course, are a great segment of American Christianity. The Southern Baptists, the uh, Pentecostals, the Assembly of God, all of these are very fervent groups, uh, and they've basically been very pro-Israel, pro-Zionist. Many of them have actually closed the door to conversion by saying, oh, well, you don't need Jesus. You're a Jew. In the Houston Chronicle, John Hagee was quoted as saying, I'm not trying to convert the Jewish people to the Christian faith. There is nothing in the Night to Honor Israel that does that. In fact, trying to convert Jews is a waste of time, he said. The Jewish person who has roots in Judaism is not going to convert to Christianity. Everyone else, whether Buddhist or Baha'i, needs to believe in Jesus, he says, but not Jews. Jews already have a covenant with God that has never been replaced with Christianity. And really, that's the most anti-Semitic thing you could possibly say don't evangelize the Jews, because that's going to send the Jews to hell. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Yet John Hagee teaches that the Jews are already good to go. We don't need to evangelize the Jews. Well, John Hagee is totally wrong. The Bible tells us that we are to win the lost, and we are to preach the gospel to every creature. Now, I mentioned earlier about C.I. Schofield being divorced and remarried. Isn't it interesting that John Hagee is the same story? Divorced his wife, remarried another lady, and leads a large Pentecostal church and emphasizes Israel to the point of idolatry. Free is free indeed. Give him praise and glory in the house of God. From the 18,000 people who belong to his church in San Antonio, Texas, John Hagee today. to the 99 million homes he says tune into his weekly radio and television broadcast, John Hagee has built an empire sharing the gospel of Israel with evangelicals around the world. And as the leader of Kufan, 
His power extends from the pulpit to politics. John Hagee is a blasphemous false teacher who teaches that Jesus Christ did not come to this earth to be the Messiah. In defense of Israel will shape Christian theology. It scripturally proves that the Jewish people as a whole did not reject Jesus as Messiah. It will also prove that Jesus did not come to earth to be the Messiah. It will prove that there was a Calvary conspiracy between Rome, the high priest and Herod to execute Jesus as an insurrectionist too dangerous to live. Since Jesus refused by word and deed to claim to be the Messiah, how can the Jews be blamed for rejecting what was never offered? Read it in this shocking expose in defense of Israel. This latest book by Pastor John Hagee is destined to generate lively discussions among Christians the world over. John Hagee is not an, an independent Baptist nor a King James Bible believer. And so a lot of guys that watch this documentary will say, well, that's not our guys. All right, well, how about Sam Gipp, who just about a year ago preached in a church in Idaho and said, and I, and I can almost quote it word for word, you know what I never call Jesus? I never call him my Messiah. You know what I never call Jesus Christ? I never call him my Messiah. You know why? I say, oh, he's a Messiah. He ain't your Messiah. Unless you're a Jew, he's not your, he's not your Messiah. Are, are you from Gentile stock? All right, we were never promised a Messiah. I'm sorry, but Sam Gipp is wrong. And he might be popular even among independent Baptists, but that's wrong. Whether it's Sam Gipp or Peter Ruckman or whoever it is, the Word of God is the Word of God, and we don't allow, whether it's Schofield or John Hagee or our favorite preacher, our favorite professor or teacher, to influence what the Word actually says. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is my Messiah. He's everyone's Messiah. Hagee goes on to say in the Houston Chronicle article, Many Christian theologians are anti-Semitic because they say the covenant with the Jews is gone, that the Jews have been replaced by Christianity, and that Israel does not deserve American military and financial support. Not only do Christian Zionists like Hagee teach that Christians must support Israel, they also demand that the U.S. government support Israel militarily and financially. And because evangelical Christians make up a large part of the voting populace, politicians dutifully make the trip to Israel to pray to the Jewish God at the Wailing Wall. There's a, a lot of uh, socially conservative, evangelical Republican voters who care a lot about this issue. And if they can see Ted Cruz coming out on Fox News and saying, you know, I am 100% behind Israel, when they see that happening, a lot of conservative voters are going to say, hey, this Cruz guy is better than I thought. In fact, they just had the Christians United for Israel event, which is right. which is an organization of evangelical Christians that are that are that are very very pro Israel. This is an image. I think we have this of Rand Paul praying with them. <laughs> um, this is there there right. is he's, yeah. he's praying uh, with the QV folks. Let me say this: those who hate Israel hate America, and those who hate Jews hate Christians. So opposition to Israel is opposition to God. And I don't care what they believe and where they're at on the spiritual timeline because it's not my problem. I have his back. And it doesn't matter what he does or where he's at. But as long as he calls upon the name of, of Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's my brother. There's going to be, I think, a, a turn towards a more biblical Christianity, a more, a more Jewish Christianity. And the, the lines between us, that was like, oh, those are Christians, those are Jews, are going to be like, oh, those are sort of like our, those are our brothers. Israel is grateful for the support of America's people and of America's presidents, from Harry Truman to Barack Obama. In fact, I am proud to say that no U.S. administration has done more in support of Israel's security than ours. None. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. It is a fact. We recognize Israel's right to defend itself and that it is right for America to stand with you. Therefore, it is time for America to embrace the words of Senator Joseph Lieberman, 
and consider a military preemptive strike against Iran to prevent a nuclear holocaust in Israel and a nuclear attack in America. In 2 Chronicles 19, a godly king by the name of Jehoshaphat was going to help Israel militarily. Here's what God told him in verse 2. And Jehu, the son of Hanani the seer, went out to meet him and said to the king Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. So we're told today that if we support the nation of Israel, we're going to be blessed by God because of Genesis 12. When in reality, the Bible teaches that if we help an ungodly and wicked nation like Israel, we'll have God's wrath upon us. Why should we, as Bible-believing Christians, support the nation of Israel when the nation of Israel won't even allow a Christian to immigrate to their country? If you want to immigrate to Israel, you have to renounce the name of Jesus Christ. So for someone to become an Orthodox Jew or have the right of return, they have to renounce Christianity, they for do. example. They do. You can't be a Jew and a Christian. Mm -hmm. It's one or the other. So with regard to the modern state of Israel, it requires the renunciation of one's former religious affiliation. Mm -hmm. it, it requires a number of rituals that are designed to cleanse one of their prior religious affiliation. Someone who's not a Jew doesn't just automatically have an invitation to immigrate to Israel. Then. Not as a citizen. Not as a citizen. Correct. So in order to be able to immigrate to Israel, they would have to renounce Christianity in order to... To become a citizen. To become a citizen. And they'd have to be converted by an Orthodox rabbi. I personally know men who have gone over to Israel believing that Israel is the promised land and that the Jews are God's chosen people, and they go there with that in their heart, and they go there to witness to them and tell them about Christ. But it is illegal in Israel to pass out tracts. The cops will come and harass them, and even being under the threat of arrest or deportation. The Bible is true when it tells us that they are the enemies of the gospel. In Romans 11:28, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. It says it right there in the Word of God. They are the enemy of the gospel. In June of 2014, during Gay Pride Month, the United States Embassy flew the American flag and underneath the American flag, they hoisted the Gay Pride flag. And for the last few years now, Tel Aviv has been voted the number one gay city in the world amongst the gay community themselves, they have voted Tel Aviv as the number one place in the world. Not San Francisco, not New York, but Tel Aviv. We were established for the establishment of Israel. Our markings are all over. Take out a dollar out of your pocket. Look at the great seal. You'll notice in between the wingspan of the eagle, you will see the Star of David made out of 13 stars. Now why is the Star of David there? Around that star is the Shekinah glory cloudburst, symbolizing the Shekinah glory that was over the tabernacle. George Washington said, I want that to be on the dollar so that people will recognize the contribution that the Jewish people have made to the United States of America. Not only are today's Christians being taught to be pro-Jewish and pro-Israel, the strange doctrines of the Talmud and the Kabbalah are also creeping into churches and being taught as Christian doctrine. For example, many pastors will use the term Shekinah as if it were something from the Hebrew Old Testament, when in reality, the word is never found in the Bible one time. So the Shekinah refers to the divine presence. And it's a feminine word, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's not masculine. For example, if Moses the Leon had come out and said, I have an idea, God is a woman, that might not have gone over so well. But now he was saying that the ancient Rabbi Shimon was teaching us about Shekhinah, the feminine half of God, and her romance with her divine partner, the Holy One, blessed be he. So there is a belief that God could be both male and female. The Shekhinah is the 
indwelling presence of God in the universe. It's what emanates from the being of God. But for Jews, Shekhinah and God are one and the same, and it is almost forbidden to separate them. Okay. God simply manifests himself or herself in the form of the inspiration of the Shekhinah. Shekinah is something that's part of the Talmud, something that's part of Judaism, not Christianity. And yet, how many Baptist preachers have used that phrase, Shekinah glory, in church, and it's not even scriptural? Friends, we need to grasp this, that the Shekinah glory is in us. This presence that we talked about, this presence that came in this upper room to the disciples, this Shekinah glory, it's in us as believers. The Bible is clear from Genesis to Revelation that God is a he, not a she. And to teach that God is both a he and a she, you've got a different God. The Christian Bible teaches that man was made in the image of God. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Bible says that a man ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. So according to 1 Corinthians 11, man is not to cover his head because man is in the image of God as opposed to woman. That's why even in Genesis 1:27 it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. They were created male and female, but he was created in the image of God. What does it mean to be in the image of God? To look like God. Because when Jesus walked on this earth, he was a man. And God the Father is masculine. And so uh, this is a blasphemous teaching of New Age mysticism, of worshiping, you know, Mother Earth and the female spirit and the goddess and the Kabbalah and the New Age. That's where all this stuff is coming from. This is the shape of the letter Shin, Hebrew alphabet Shin. Very interesting letter in the, in the uh, language. It, it's the first letter in the word Shaddai, the first letter in the word Shalom, first letter in the word Shekhinah, which is the name of the feminine aspect of God. Live long and prosper, image of Sirach, father of all we now hold true. It's great. It's great. People don't realize they're blessing each other with this. <laughs> it's great. When Christians learn the information presented thus far in this film, Many are still hung up on the idea that the Jews are physically descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that the rest of us are all Gentiles. But is it really that simple? The only way a person could really prove that they're a Jew would be with the genealogy. In fact, most of today's so-called Jews, they don't know what tribe they're from. Do people know amongst the Jewish community hey, I'm of converts, or hey, I'm actually of the tribe of Judah, or the tribe of Benjamin, or the tribe. As far as the tribe is concerned, we don't know. I don't know what tribe I belong to. Mm. The only ones who do know, I mentioned the Kohen, the ones, right. they know, because that's transferred from father to son, father to son. Okay. Because there are still certain things that the Kohen slash priest, certain blessings that he says, and so on and so forth. So they've kept their lineage, they know. Myself, I, I have no idea what tribe my ancestors okay. belong to. And, and you say probably most Jews don't know what tribe. Nobody, yeah, very, it's just, uh, that wasn't preserved. It's not really important. Today it's not important at all, no. Okay. If it really made a difference who is descended from Israel and who is not, then why would God tell us to avoid genealogies? The Bible says in Titus 3, 9 that we are to avoid genealogies. The New Testament is very clear. It doesn't matter where your physical ancestors came from. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. The Bible says clearly there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. So why do we think today that there's a difference between the Jew and the Greek? And we think that somehow if someone is descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that they somehow are just automatically God's chosen people, whether or not they believe on Jesus Christ. And they may be circumcised in the flesh, but the Bible says it's the circumcision of the heart and the spirit that makes you a Jew in God's eyes. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, it says in verse 4, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. I want you to keep that phrase in your mind. Endless genealogies, which minister questions 
rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now in Titus, he just said avoid genealogies. But here he says to avoid endless genealogies. Now I'm going to show you why genealogies are endless. They truly are endless. This is what a family tree looks like. Now, at the bottom of this family tree, we just have one person, which is you. Now, you descend from two people, don't you? Your mother and your father. So if we go back one generation, you come from two people as a direct descendant, right? But if we go back another generation, you don't just have two grandparents, you have four grandparents. And it keeps doubling, doesn't it? Because you have two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great-grandparents, and you have 32 great-great-great-grandparents. That means if I were going to do a family tree that went back five generations, I would have to have a piece of paper wide enough to where at the top of that paper I'd be able to have 32 people's names, wouldn't I? Because that's how many ancestors I'm going to have directly in that fifth generation. Now, if I went to the sixth generation, my paper is going to have to be twice as wide because now I'm going to have 64 slots to put in names, right? Well, what happens, though, is that as we go back further, this number gets really big. Now, in order to understand how this chart works, we have to understand how long a generation is. How long is the average generation then? Well, they say 20 to 25 years. Okay. Now, a generation has nothing to do with lifespan. For example, my mother was 30 years old when she gave birth to me, and women generally give birth between the ages of 20 and 40. So let's just take 30 as an average. 30 is a nice round number, and 30 is a very conservative number for this calculation. So a generation is 30 years, meaning somebody has a child when they're 30, and then they have a child when they're 30, they have a child when they're 30. Nothing to do with lifespan. So that means that if we go back 10 generations, then that's 300 years, right? So let's just round off and say that if we went back in our family tree about 10 generations, we're going to be at about the year 1700. Now, because our family tree is getting wider, if we wanted to do a complete family tree showing all of our ancestors back to the 10th generation, we would have to have a piece of paper that was wide enough to have 1,024 slots. Because 10 generations ago, there would be 1,024 a, a, a people that we would directly descend from. Now, here's what I noticed when I did my family tree, though. When I went back 10 generations, you know what I started noticing? These are no longer unique people. Because there had been some intermarriage in that 300 years that had unknowingly taken place. Let's go back 20 generations. So now we're back around the year 1400. Well, if I wanted to have a complete family tree, I would have to have a piece of paper that could fit 1,048,576 names. That's a pretty big piece of paper. So in the year 1400, if I'm gonna trace all of my ancestors, I mean, I'm gonna tell you who all of my ancestors from the 1400s are, I would have to show you a family tree that just at the top would have a million some people, just in the top row let alone everything else coming downward, right? If I were to go back 30 generations, now I'm only in the year 1100. I'm not even close to the time of Christ yet, am I? No. If I went back to the year 1100, 30 generations, I would have 1,073,741,824 ancestors in that generation. Now, listen, they're not all unique. I, when I did my genealogy, I found this relative that she was my 10th great-grandmother on this side and my 11th great-grandmother over here because people marry their 5th and 6th cousin without knowing it, mm. obviously. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of repeating going on, right? You know what that shows? That a lot of people are descending from the same people. Cannot help but intermarry. It's impossible not to because of these numbers. Now, but look. The real number that we want to go back to is not 1100 AD. Let's go back to 70 AD, because 70 AD is when all the Jews were scattered. Now, when you say scattered all over the world, do you mean that in the most literal sense? I mean, all nations? Yes, in the most literal sense. If we were to go back to 70 AD, and we were to have a family tree that shows all of our ancestors in 70 AD and how they're connected, that top line would have 18 quintillion, 446 
quadrillion, 744 trillion names from 70 AD. Now, who thinks that there were 18 quintillion, 446 quadrillion, 744 trillion people living at the time of Christ or shortly thereafter? No. In fact, the approximate population at that time was 200 million. Of that 200 million, let's just call seven or eight million Jews. You say, I don't like that number. Well, that number is not going to matter in a minute. Okay. So let's just call it seven, seven, eight million. Okay. So if there are 200 million people on the earth at the time of the temple being destroyed, and about seven or eight million of them are Jews, that means if I have an ancestor from that era, there's a one in 27 chance that they were of Israel. So think about this. What if I were buying a lottery ticket? And the odds of that lottery ticket coming up a winner are one in 27. Because that's the winning ticket that says, you're Jewish, you're of the chosen people, you are of Israel, you are an Israelite indeed. I've got a one in 27 chance. You say, well, Pastor Anderson, if you have a one in 27 chance, you're probably not going to win that lottery because you got 26 chances of losing. Okay, but what if I buy 18 quintillion lottery tickets? You got it. You think I'm going to win? Let me ask this, how many times do I have to hit it to be descended from Abraham? How many times do I have to hit it to be descended from Israel? You say, well, you know, I'm black. I'm of Africa. You know, how can I be connected with Abraham? Well, stop and think about it. Think about Israel's children. You know what? One of Israel's children, Joseph, guess where his wife was from? Egypt. Joseph's wife was of Egypt. Where's Egypt? Africa. Moses' wife was Ethiopian. His second wife was Ethiopian. So we already see, even in Bible days, intermingling with Africa, intermingling with the sons of Ham. I mean, if you think about it, the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh were half of Ham and half of, of Israel because Israel's son, Joseph, married an Egyptian woman who's of Ham. So all of the Ephraimites and Manassites are descended of Ham. And not only that, but all throughout history, you've had all kinds of merchants and missionaries and conquerors. Even, you know, you think of the Mongolian Empire that went all over the world and that conquered China, that conquered Japan, that conquered Korea. All the ships that sailed and went here and there and everywhere. You only have to have one ancestor out of your millions and millions of ancestors, you only have to have one that descends from Israel and you are a direct descendant of Israel today. You sit there and say, oh, I'm just purely a white person. Oh, I'm just purely Asian. I'm just purely African. No, you're not. No one is. People have been marrying and intermarrying for thousands of years. So, you can't have any pure uh, population. You know what? The Bible was right when it said we're all of one blood. Even populations that we think that has got to be 100%, they're not 100%. And that there was is rare. no 100%. So, you can sit there and have your endless genealogy. It won't even be accurate. Because you know what you can't tell from a genealogy? Somebody who committed adultery and lied to their husband and said, oh yeah, this is your son and he's not, you know, people do their genealogy mm -hmm. and they kind of just take everything as gospel when in reality there could be, as you euphemistically call them, non-paternity events. There's a non-paternity index uh, mm -hmm. which uh, has been estimated at 0.05% uh, per generation. Mm -hmm. So if you go back 20 generations, you're likely to have a non-paternity event. That's the soft way of saying it. And if you consider that a generation is 20 to 25 years, that means in 500 years, you're due <laughs> in that line to, uh, to have a non-paternity event. Every 500 years. Yeah. In, in, in one line. So you know, on uh, one line. In and one line. How many but lines, how many lines you have. Right. right. So really, if somebody traces their genealogy, they couldn't really say, hey, I know for a fact I know the whole story because I'm looking at this genealogy because the DNA test is going to reveal more. Well, DNA doesn't lie. 
and all people lie. DNA right. doesn't lie. Right. <laughs> so people could say, "Hey, I'm I'm Jewish, I, and I'm not exactly. Jewish." Exactly. But the DNA. Right. A DNA doesn't have an agenda. People right. have an agenda. People right. have reasons to lie, uh -huh. and also they might just not know the truth. You know, which yeah, is sure. is possible. So as it's well. not even that they're lying. It's just no, that they're mistaken. They're just passing on mistaken information. One out of fifteen. Americans is adopted or has a parent that was adopted. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's a pretty high number too, yeah. isn't it? I mean, who can tell you all the people in your in your lineage that were adopted? Oh yeah, my ancestors 300 years ago were adopted. You're not going to remember that. So there are adoptions, there's infidelity, there's traveling, there's conquest, there's merchants, there are missionaries. Different people have different things they wanted to hide. Right. And so they only tell you what they want you to hear. It doesn't matter where you're from, folks. God, you know why God said to avoid this? Because it hurts your mind to even think about this number. <laughs> you know? I, mean, it, it, I mean, these numbers bend the mind. He's just like, just avoid it. You know, he just... Avoid endless, you know, you know what, they minister questions. I mean, does, does this make you feel really sure about your nationality now? No, it, it raises a lot of questions. So what do you think about somebody going down to the DNA lab, getting their DNA tested, <clears throat> and, and it comes back and says, oh, you know, you have these Jewish ancestors. I mean... I have no quarrel with them. Would you accept that if it is? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Because it's so possible, because they were so scattered, right? Yeah, I would never argue with it. Mm -hmm. The director of this film, Paul Wittenberger, and I are just a couple of white guys. We've never been told that we're Jewish or have any Jewish ancestors. But we're going to go down and get our DNA tested and just find out if we do. We match your DNA profile against uh, over 400 population groups worldwide. Mm -hmm. And we present you with a top 50. And for ancestral DNA, uh, we don't have to get thumbprints. Uh, I mean, it's not a legal document. Right. So that's all we need is the swab and the name. So these will go out tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, we should get results back in about three to four weeks. A few weeks later, Paul and I got our results back. And just like they said, we were a mixture of a whole bunch of different nationalities. We had everything from Arab to Brazilian, Native American. And there were a lot of things on there that were a big surprise. And sure enough, when we looked at our deep ancestry, which goes back further than the top 50, we both had markers for Jewish DNA. So I figured I'd get my grandma's DNA tested to see if Jewish made it into her top 50. We tested my grandma, she's 94 years old. Uh-huh. And we wanted to swab her, you know, while she's still with us. Oh yes, that, I, and, that's very important. Yeah, so yeah. We, we got it. All right, Grandma's results are right, in. Let's check exciting. them out. All right, let's see her top 50, first of all. Number one, Ashkenazi Jew. Number one. No way. So that explains why it was in my deep ancestry, because it's her number one of her 50 nationalities. And her number one result was Hungarian Ashkenazi Jew. So, so her number one result was Ashkenazi Jewish. Wow. Well, with DNA consultants, I mean, you know, we've done this for many, many years. I haven't seen that very often, to let you know. Mm -hmm. And every report, like I'm saying, is unique. People are like, oh, it's probably very general. No, everybody's very unique. I don't know when I've seen number one uh, Ashkenazi. So that is... Really? No. Cool, yeah. I mean, maybe three or five times. So let times. me ask you this. That is very rare. So if grandma's DNA had number one Ashkenazi, is there any doubt that she's an Ashkenazi Jew? No. And if she's my grandmother, what does that make me? If you're Jewish. So I'm Jewish. You don't have to accept <laughs> the religion. Right, but I mean, ethnically you speaking. Ethnically you are, you know, okay. whether you, how, so whatever you, you want to do with it. Me, so you, so I've hold now on. pronounced you Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Is that really what it all boils down to? <laughs> I mean, good night, that's DNA, are you kidding me? What, what about Jesus? What about faith in Christ? How in the world can God's people be determined by DNA? Look, it doesn't matter what our genealogy says. It doesn't matter what our DNA results are. 
None of that is even important. The only thing that really matters is that we are a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And I found so much proof that Israel over there is not the Israel that God's talking about. But we who have believed in God, who have the faith of Abraham, we are the children of God. We are the seed of Abraham. It says in Romans 9 verse 7, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. So the Bible says that the children of the flesh, the physical children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these are, it specifically spells out and says they are not the children of God. In fact, in Galatians 3, it explains that we're the children of Abraham. It says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. It's amazing to me, though, how Christians overlook Galatians 3. Now, I'm, I'm almost 70 years old. I'm an old man. But I've never, ever, ever heard a sermon on Galatians 3, verse 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus, and if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Both of those are fantastic. Who is the heir to the promise? Whoever has Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11 reads, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Verse 19, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. According to this scripture, we are fellow citizens of Israel. Because back in verse number 12, he said, when you were without Christ, you were aliens of Israel. You were strangers and foreigners to Israel. But in verse 19, he says, now you are fellow citizens with the saints. So who is the true Israel? Is it some guy over in the Middle East who doesn't even believe in Jesus and is worshiping Shekinah? Or is it the true believer of the Lord Jesus Christ who's been grafted in and brought nigh unto Israel. It's very simple. Jesus said in Matthew 21, verse 43, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Wow. They didn't bear fruits. They refused Jesus. They refused redemption. They refused to recognize the deliverer of Zion, the very Christ Jesus. And Jesus said, because of that, the kingdom is taken from you and given to another nation. Well, what is that nation? Is it Syria? Is it America? Is it England? Is it Germany? No, 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 a spiritual nation. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. The Bible's not a book about God blessing one nation. That's why God told Abraham, in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. And that blessing is through Abraham's seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says in, in Hebrews chapter 11, that Abraham wasn't looking for a physical land. He looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. We as Christians are looking for a new Jerusalem. We're looking for a heavenly city. As Hebrews 11, the faith chapter points out, but now they desire a better country that is an heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. God has prepared a city for us, a city that we can't find physically on this earth because it's a heavenly city. It's something that God has prepared for those that have faith in him. When we're looking for Zion and when we're looking for Jerusalem, we're not looking for the one which now is. We're not looking for the one that we can touch. We're not looking for the one that's spiritually is Sodom and spiritually Egypt. We're, we're looking for the one that is heavenly, the one that is to come. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 22, but ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, 
the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels. So according to the New Testament, Zion is the heavenly Jerusalem, not the physical Jerusalem that now is, but the heavenly Jerusalem will descend down from heaven. That is our capital city. That is our Zion. And so I'm Israel. Those people over there are not Israel. That's why Paul said they're not all Israel, that are of Israel, maybe of Israel, genealogically speaking, but you're not Israel as God counts as what his original intent was, a people that are of praise and a glory to him. We as Christians are the chosen people of God. We are the true Israel and we are marching to Zion. Well, you know, the, the name uh, of this video is Marching to Zion. We know that as a great uh, title of a gospel song too. It means marching with Jesus at the very head of the formation. Yeah. You know, we sing songs like, we're marching to Zion. I love that song. I just love it. I mean, we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. It's the city of God. It sits on the sides of the north. That's God's home. And one day he's going to bring it down to earth. It's going to be on the earth. We're going to inherit the earth because we are God's people. We have believed in Christ, are God's people. We are Israel. We're princes with God. And we're going to reign with him forever. I would love to see the Quran thrown away, destroyed, put in a bonfire. Not because I hate the Muslims, no. I would love for them to become Christians. I would love to see the, the Talmud in all its 36 or 38 volumes. Well, what a bonfire we could have with that. As a Christian, I say, let these books exist. Let the Quran exist. Let the Talmud exist. Because if people read those, and then they read the New Testament, you must come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is Lord.
You know, the Bible's really clear on salvation. It's not based on how good you are. A lot of people think they're pretty good, you know, and yeah, they're going to get to heaven because they're pretty good. But the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, that as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I'm not righteous, you're not righteous. And if it were our goodness that would get us into heaven, none of us would be going. Because the Bible even says in Revelation 21, 8, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and sorcerers and whoremongers and idolaters, and listen to this, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I've lied before. Everybody's lied before. So we've all sinned, and we've done stuff worse than lying, let's face it. We all deserve hell. But the Bible says, but God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so Jesus Christ, because he loves us, came to this earth. The Bible says he was God manifest in the flesh. God basically took on human form. He lived a sinless life. He did not commit any sin. And, of course, they beat him and spit on him and, and nailed him to the cross. The Bible says that when he was on that cross, he himself bare our sins in his own body on the tree. So every sin you've ever done, every sin I've ever done, it was as if Jesus had done it. He was being punished for our sins. And then, of course, they took his body when he died. They took his body and buried it in the tomb. And his soul went down to hell for three days and three nights, Acts 2.31. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. He showed unto the disciples the holes in his hands. And the Bible's really clear that Jesus did die for everybody. It says that he died not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. But there's something that we must do to be saved. The Bible says, it has that question in Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And that's it. He didn't say join a church and you'll be saved, get baptized and you'll be saved, live a good life and you'll be saved, repent of all your sins and you'll be saved. No, he said believe. And even the most famous verse in the whole Bible that's written on the bottom, I mean the, the reference is written on the bottom of the cup at In-N-Out Burger. I mean it's so famous, everybody's heard of it, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And everlasting means everlasting, it means forever. And Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The Bible says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So if you believe on Jesus Christ, the Bible says you have everlasting life. You're going to live forever. You can't lose your salvation. It's eternal. It's everlasting. Once you're saved, once you believe on him, you're saved forever. And no matter what, you can never lose your salvation. Even if I were to go out and commit some awful sin, God will punish me for it on this earth. If I went out and killed somebody today, you know, God's going to make sure I get punished. I'm going to prison or, or far worse or the death penalty. Whatever this earth punishes me, and God's going to make sure I get punished even more. But I'm not going to hell. There's nothing I can do to go to hell because I'm saved. And if I went to hell, God lied because he promised that whoever believeth in him has everlasting life. And he said, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's why there are a lot of examples of people in the Bible who did some really bad stuff, yet they made it to heaven. How? Because they were so good? No, it's because they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Their sins are forgiven. Other people who may have lived a better life in the world's eyes, or maybe even really they lived a better life, they don't believe in Christ. They're going to have to go to hell to be punished for their sins. And let me just close on this one thought. One thing that I wanted to be sure and bring up today is that there was a question that was asked to Jesus by one of his disciples. And that question was this, are there few that be saved? That's a good question, right? I mean, are most people saved? Or is it few that are saved? Now, who here thinks that most people are going to heaven? Most people in this world are going to heaven. Yeah, guess what the answer was? He said, in Matthew 7, for example, he said, enter ye in at the straight gate. He said, because wide is the gate and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then he went on to say this. He said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, 
Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so you see, there are people out there. First of all, the majority of this world doesn't even claim to believe in Jesus. Thankfully, the majority of this classroom claims to believe in Jesus. Okay, But the majority of the world does not claim to believe in Jesus. But God warned that even amongst those who claim to believe in Jesus, even amongst those that call him Lord, many will be saying to him, what if all our, we did all these wonderful works. Why aren't we saved? He's going to say, depart from me. I never you. That's, why, that's because salvation is not by works. And if you're trusting your own works to save you, if you think you're going to heaven because you've been baptized, or if you think you, well, I think you have to live a good life. I think you have to keep the commandments to be saved. I think you have to go to church. I think you got to, you know, turn from your sins. You know, if you're trusting in your works, Jesus is going to say to you one day, depart from me. I never knew you. You have to have all your faith in what he did. You have to put your faith in what Jesus did on the cross when he died for you, he's buried and rose again. That's your ticket into heaven. If you're trusting all the things, oh, I'm going to heaven because I'm such a good Christian and I do all these wonderful things. He's going to say, depart from me. And notice what he said. Depart from me, I never knew you. Not I used to know you. Because once he knows you, remember I mentioned this earlier, it's everlasting, it's eternal. Once he knows you, you're saved forever. But he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because if you go to hell, it's because he never knew you. Because once he knows you, he knows you. It's just like my children will always be my children. You know, when you're born again, when you're his child, you'll always be his child. You may be the black sheep of the family. You know, you may be uh, somebody who gets disciplined by God heavily on this earth. You can screw up your life down here, but you can't screw that up. You know, you're saved. It's a done deal. And so that's the main thing that I wanted to present to you about the end times. And we do have just a few minutes for uh, questions about either uh, salvation or about the end times.